I wish I had enough time to cover everything, but I don't. So I'm going to pick out kind of the most important things and make sure I get to those right off the bat. So is it going? OK, I see the red light. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think for a moment and tell me, how long would you estimate the typical college freshman can read material in their book or in their notes and effectively be learning what they're reading? OK, okay. five minutes, says Chris. 25 minutes. Hour? Now let me ask, anybody think more than an hour? How long? <laughs> By the way, I, I had a guy, last time I did this, he said, oh, I can do it about six hours. And I just, <laughs> well, then I found out he is a medical resident, just finished medical school. His wife was in my class. And uh, indeed, uh, my daughter's fourth year med, oh yeah, four or five hours. But that's not typical, I can tell you, OK? Anybody less than five minutes? OK. So we get five to maybe four or five hours. A study was done, I believe the University of Michigan. They asked students to do the following thing. When you're ready to study, You've got all your materials. You're back in your little dorm room or your place you live. Check your watch. Start working. The moment you feel that sense of, I've read it, but it's not coming through, and it's like, eh, I'm wasting my time. And we all get that feeling. Note what time it is. Record that. Bring it back. And they had many, many hundreds of freshmen and sophomores do this. And then somebody took the time to compile it. And typically, right about 25 to 30 minutes. By the way, it's also true of lectures. And you've all proved it to yourself. You come into a lecture, you're really alert. Check the clock at about 25 after. It's like, yeah. And I see it in every class I teach. But how long do we teach? 50 minutes. And yet, probably most of the learning, if it's going to happen, is in the first 25 to 30. OK. I'm going to talk about a person, because I also like to teach by anecdote. A woman named Jeanette. I was a junior at Western. She was a freshman. Because I was a junior, I could live off campus. Those days, colleges were your parents in absentia. She had to live in a dorm, because she didn't have a relative in town. We were dating. She got her first quarter at Western a D average, 1.0. 15 credits of D. She decided she really needed to buckle down. Plus, the school said, if you don't make it up, you're going to be kicked out. So the second quarter of her freshman year, she set the following goal, to study for six hours a night, nonstop, six to midnight, Sunday night through Thursday night. Friday, Saturday, she could party. The rest of the week, she was going to study. Now, one would assume, my gosh, going from little studying to six hours a night, five nights of the week, she should have aced everything. You want to guess her grade point, second quarter? Zero point zero. She failed every class. And this is why telling people to study more does not necessarily help. In some cases, it might actually worsen their performance. What I want to do is show you graphically what I'm talking about. Let's say this is efficient studying. And I know there are no numbers there. But higher means more efficient. Lower means low or no efficiency. And this axis, we're looking at time. Here's what happens for the average student. For her, 6 o'clock in the evening, after her supper at the residency dining hall, she plopped herself down at her little study area and started studying. But here's what happened. By about 6.30, 
She was in a major slump. But what was her goal? To study six hours. So she continued to sit at her little desk and stare at pages. until midnight. She was at her desk six hours. How long did she actually study? About 20, 30 minutes. Now, there's a simple conduct in psychology that all of you are aware of. Things that are reinforced, we tend to do more of. Things that are punished or ignored, we tend to do less of. You know, we operate by those principles to a large degree. If you're sitting there for six hours, are you feeling good? No. Once you get here, you're looking at your book going, I hate geography. I hate literature. I hate psychology. All the things we're trying to get you to fall in love with, you're hating it. And so her actual good studying was followed by five and a half hours of pain and misery. I would bet you, I don't know for a fact, that as the quarter progressed, she sat down, and finally, she was done before she even started. She sat down and just stared at a book, and she flunked every class. Now, had she taken this little seminar, or had figured things out on her own, she'd know what to do. First rule, the moment you start to slide, you're shoveling against the tide. What you need to do is what? Take a break. And here's what's cool about it. You can study for a half hour. It doesn't take a half hour break to recharge your batteries. For most people, about five minutes. And this is where you go away, do something fun for five minutes. Call a friend, talk to a child, talk to a parent, a roommate. Enjoy some music. Do something you enjoy and actually say, this is my treat for having studied for 30 minutes effectively. Go back and here's what happens. Your efficiency is nearly 100%. Study a half hour, take a break. Study a half hour, study a half hour. Now, had she done that over a course of six hours, she would have got about five and a half hours of serious studying and about a half hour of total break time. I really don't believe she would have flunked out. Now, I get students complaining, I don't have enough time to study. Look for a break at work. Look for a break at home. Those little 15, 20 minutes can be very efficient if you apply them efficiently. Unfortunately, sometimes it's really tough to get those moments. But you need to build them in somehow. You've got to have at least some time to study. It's not going to happen through osmosis. Now, I'm going to ask you a final question. Let's say you've studied till midnight. What do you want to do after your last study 20, 30 minutes? No, not yet. You want to give yourself a big treat, OK? Whenever you're studying time is done, plan something special. Now, for most women, especially with kids, it's a Calgon bath with candles and the bathroom door locked and the statement, if you bother me, I will take your head off. This is where guys go, what? Yeah, moms have no privacy. Kids walk in while you're using the toilet, while you're in the tub, they'll bring their friends with them, won't they? Dads don't put up with that. <laughs> when dads are in the bathroom, it's lock the door, tough luck, go elsewhere. For you guys, I'll give you mine. This is politically incorrect. I liked beer, okay? My goal was to knock out all my studying, go to the Iron Bull Tavern in Bellingham, knock down a couple beers for my treat. Now my buddies, they'd say, Lobdale, how are you getting straight A's? Well, I'd studied starting at about 3 in the afternoon. By 9 o'clock at night, when pictures went on cheap, I'd done all my studying. I went in and enjoyed my beer. These yahoos started drinking in the afternoon, then went to the tavern, planning to go home and study. <laughs> you know that's not going to happen. Okay? 
you're not going to study. And even if you do what's called state-dependent memory, you'll typically only remember if you're intoxicated. And I don't recommend getting drunk before a test. It's kind of a stupid thing. If you plan your day right, you can have those little study breaks. But the coolest part is this. Because you're now reinforcing it with those little breaks and something fun, you extend it. And you'll find you can go 30, 40, 50, an hour, an hour and a half. And this is training. Those of you who go on to advanced degrees, you're going to have to study incredible lengths of time without taking a break because you've got to get it done, like my daughter in med school. It's just amazing. I've told her I couldn't do it now, or actually I wouldn't do it. You're training yourself, and if you do it right, it becomes progressively easier. Okay, next question. How many of you have a true study or library in your place of residence? Okay. Two? Two of you, if I'm seeing correctly. I've always envied that. A quiet place to actually do reading or studying, okay? I'm going to make a prediction. Many of you study in your bedroom, okay? How many of you study in your bedroom? We'll raise high so everybody can see. Mm -hmm. That's where I studied a lot, especially when I did go to community college. If you don't study in your bedroom, hmm, I bet some of you study at the dining room table slash kitchen table or bar. How many of you study at the dining, kitchen, bar? Okay. Now, if you don't study in those two places and you don't have a study or library, you study in the family room, rec room, living room, the place where your TV and stereo is, your couch, your easy chair. How many of you study there? Okay. Now, some of you might actually drive to a school or library. Any of you do that? Go to a, okay, a few of you do. I still remember <laughs> living at home, going to Highline Community College. My folks bought me a little desk. I still have it, okay? Little desk, and I'd come home, because I did work then at Albertsons. Typically, we got off at 9, get home about 10. And I'd start studying. I still remember reading Billy Budd, okay, Melville. And I'm li or sitting there studying, and my eyes are just... Mm. And then the bed started calling to me. <laughs> Marty, come lie upon me. Now, those of you who've studied the... Greek, the idea of the sirens calling sailors to the rocks. Oh, it's real. I'd hear the bed call me, and I'd finally go, oh, I'll just lie down for a moment. <laughs> Next thing, my mom would be yelling, Marty, you're late for your English class. And he's like, oh, God, I didn't read Billy Budd, and I'm screwed. <laughs> Let me ask you, what's the primary function of a bedroom? What's the secondary function? Good! Most groups go, <laughs> and I go, take Psych 20 or 225 to learn about it. It's functional, okay? Primary function of a dining table? Eating. Primary function of a living area? Okay? Recreation, socializing, right? Now, a lot of students don't realize how much we're controlled by environmental cues. How many of you have been to the Tacoma Mall? Funny, isn't it? Why'd you raise your hand? Have you ever been to Tacoma? You answered. Why didn't you go like this? Why? Because if I'm asking the entire class, you've been trained to do what? And you don't even think about it. How many have you been to Tacoma Mall? <laughs> Hands go up, okay? But if I walked up to you, Chris, you ever been to Seattle? Totally stupid, right? <laughs> when you're talking face to face, you respond verbally. Okay? When you ask a group, hands come up. Now, here's what's bad. Now that I've tricked you, you won't raise your hand. It's like, I'm not going to raise my hand. Okay? But can you see how powerful it is? Without thinking, because we're in a classroom, how many have been to them all? Hands shoot up. Same is true of going in your bedroom and trying to study. You're in the bedroom. Now, 
a piece of research done at University of Hawaii. Researchers asked the students, what's the biggest problem with studying? They said, we can't get into it. The university in question had primarily dorm rooms, very few commuter students to the university. Most of you have seen a dorm room. Oh, okay. Most of you have seen a dorm room. They're usually rectangular if it's a tuplex. One side bed, another side of bed, everything kind of mirror image. Study area, study area, right? You've got a closet or wardrobe. So it's real interesting. In one room, you sleep, you groom, you talk with people, you socialize, you study, you snack. You're all in one room. It's a multi-purpose room. And yet you're supposed to study. If your door is open, what happens? Everybody, hey, Lobdell, what's up? You know, and then they got to come in and talk to you. Very quickly, you can't get to studying. Well, the professors heard that the students couldn't get into studying, but they knew what the dorms looked like. In the Hawaiian dorms, all of the rooms had a gooseneck lamp. So the professor said, we're going to try a little experiment. Take that lamp, make a little sign, and put it on it, study lamp. Okay? Use it only for studying. You don't dress by it. You don't have BS sessions by it. You don't snack by it. You don't clean the room by it. Nothing. You use the other lights for all other functions. Here's the way it works, and it's so easy. Every one of you can do this. Get a little lamp. You probably have one already. If you don't, my gosh, yard sale, garage sale, you can pick them up for nothing. Get that lamp, and it becomes your study lamp. So if you have to study in your bedroom, turn your desk away from the bed. That's the like, how many have been to the mall? It makes you want to go to sleep. By the way, you can't study in the bed. It's also bad for your back if you know about posture. Turn your back to the bed, have a blank wall, have your lamp, have your books ready to go, because you can futz away a lot of time getting ready, can't you? How many of you can futz and futz? Yeah. You're ready to go, turn on the lamp, and start studying. The moment you lose your edge, 15, 20, 30 minutes later, turn the lamp off, get up, and leave the desk. What you're training yourself to study while seated there. And it becomes increasingly automatic, as did the raising of the hand. You sit, turn the lamp on, and you're ready to go. It's like magic. The students who did that were one grade point higher the next term compared to the control group that didn't do it. One grade point simply by creating a study area. Now, if you study in the kitchen dining, remove all food cues, because I know what happens there. You start thinking, turkey in the fridge. Yeah, Swiss cheese in the fridge. Oh, yeah, sandwich time. How many of you have studied and created sandwiches? It takes about a half hour to make a really good one. You eat it, so damn good, what do you do? Make another one. And pretty soon, not only are you not studying, but you're getting the spread going, okay? <laughs> you're really frustrated then. The living area... I'm going to tell you, you can do this experiment. You try to study in the living room, and you're focused, and other people are listening to music, watching a movie, watching TV. They won't leave you alone. Hey, Marty, Marty, look, 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 it's really good. Excuse me, I'm studying. And then they get angry at you. Well, boo on you, too. You can't study in the living area. It's not designed for that, unless you're all by yourself. And you turn off the TV... Turn down the stereo so it's truly background. If you're singing along to your favorite song, you're not studying. You're singing along to a song. Your brain has to be focused to be really studying, not time sharing back and forth between singing and studying. So living areas, very tough to create. But if that's where you have to do it, you bring your little study lamp in, everything else off, turn on your study lamp, and create a study there. Are you getting the idea? Now, I'm going to go through a lot of suggestions. Break it up into small chunks, reinforce it. Simple to do. Create a study area. Simple to do. And you'll be amazed if you take these ideas and do them. I'm going to make a challenge to all of you. 
it's so easy to sit through a presentation, say, yeah, yeah, that sounds good, and then walk away and do nothing. Technically, as a psychologist, if it doesn't change your behavior, you haven't learned it. It's just in your head. To be a true learning experience, you have to behave differently. So my hope is you all make a promise. I'll try at least one or two of what I talk about today. And when you find out it works, say, gosh, I'll try a third one, maybe a fourth. I went back to grad school in the mid-80s. Second time around, I actually aced every class. PLU gives pluses. I got pluses in all but one class. I didn't do that first time. Okay? I was a good student, but not that good. I used the principles I learned about in teaching psych to become a student. And I wish somebody had told me these things when I was a student the first time. It would have been a lot easier. Okay, so we've got two things going. Break your study up into little pieces with reinforcement. Create a study area if you don't have one. I think you said you do have a study. There you go. Okay. Next thing, the more active you are in your learning, the more effective. And yet, increasingly, I have students who think studying is reading it over and over, and they're going to have some magical thing where they suddenly understand it and remember it well. When you're reading it over and over, or saying it over and over, the term for that is rote memorization spelled R-O-T-E. It can work. It is the way most of us were taught in elementary school. The way I understand it, a lot of Asian schools depend heavily on rote. And some of you may be darn good at it. And if you can memorize and actually understand by repetition and it's effective for you, don't change. But for most of us, it's not the most efficient or effective way. The way to learn efficiently in college, first you have to decide, what am I learning? Is it a concept or a fact? A fact is the discrete little piece of information. Sigmund Freud is the father of psychoanalysis. That's a fact, okay? But understanding what psychoanalysis is, is a concept, okay? Understanding the name of a bone is a fact. Understanding what it does in the body gets into a concept, okay? So in studying, sometimes there are a lot of facts. In fact, I use anatomy as a good example. You gotta memorize bones, muscles, organs, tissues, a lot of it. But if you simply memorize and don't understand the function of it, the comprehension of the actual concepts, it's a lot of wasted learning, really. Just to know a name of a bone is like, yes, yeah, so what, okay? What does it do? How does it function? So if it's a fact or a factoid, you have to approach it one way, and I'll talk about how you do that. But in most college classes, what we as professors are most concerned about is that you grasp the concept. Because concepts, once grasped, will stay with you a lifetime. Facts can easily get confused, but that's why we have Google, why we have reference books. If you know the concept, you can quickly look up the fact if you have to know that for particular fact. Neat thing is, I get questions, who has more advantage, younger students or older students? Depends on what you're talking about. Most of us, as we get older, realize concepts are what are really important to make our lives better, to be effective in our work, to be effective in our personal lives. Facts, though, we realize we can look up. We can get those if we need them. Young people actually often learn facts very quickly, but they never think about the concept. And I'll give you a simple example. I'm an old guy. When I was a bit younger, I would sing along with the radio with my adolescent daughter in the car. Oh, Dad, if you don't know the words, don't sing the song. I'd say, okay, Beth, you're right. I'm not singing exactly what he or she is singing, but it's conceptually the same. What? I'd say, what's the song about? I don't know. She couldn't tell me what the song was about, but she could tell me every word in the song. That's earning or learning facts and not seeing the concept. 
I, as an adult, I know the concept. I just make up my own lyrics, okay? Because I don't worry about the factual. Now, some of you are going, yeah, but my teacher does. I got to know the facts as well as the concepts. So we'll first deal with concepts. Here's the question. Can you put the concept in your own words? If you can't, you don't really understand it. Okay? It's not meaningful to you. To make it meaningful is a struggle. It's probably the biggest struggle you have as a student. But it's a struggle you need to do or you're wasting your study time. Now I'm going to give you an example. Only one of you probably in this room will understand what I just say or will be saying. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And I knew she would get that. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Raj, you do? Cool, two of you. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And most of you are going, it's all Greek to me. It's actually probably more Latin, but I'm not certain of that, okay? When I was a biology student, I learned about the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And if you try to learn that, and you don't understand it, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. Okay? You can't hold on to it. But if I take a moment to break it down, ontogeny means your own development as a being. Okay? You as a human, for example. Recapitulates means goes back through or recaptures, retraces phylogeny, which is the development all the way from single cell to complex mammal. Now, to make sense of that, how did all of you start in utero? A single fertilized cell, right? An ovum that's fertilized. And then it starts dividing and you get all that. But you get a little period, and this is what they first looked at embryos, where we look like a little thing that looks like a tadpole, right? Yeah, tadpole-ish. So we start with a single egg that's fertilized, and then we get this little thing that looks kind of like a tadpole. And they thought these were gill slits, okay? They're not, they're just what becomes the thoracic area. But there's no legs. It looks like a little tail. Oh, we had a tail. Got the idea? Well, then we get our arm buds and we get them growing, you know, so we now get arms and legs. And gradually, we start looking more like a human being. By the way, take an embryo of any mammal. You probably couldn't tell one from the other. Human, pig, doesn't matter. They all look very much alike, don't they? Now, you understand ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, but if an instructor doesn't take the time to tell you that, and you just read it and go, eh, whatever, I'll memorize it, you will forget it about as quickly as you can get through it. I'm not going to prove this. You all get to do a little memory task. Got to find the right... Here we go. I'm going to read to you 13 letters from our alphabet. You all know the alphabet, right? Should be meaningful. As soon as I finish, I want you to say them back to me in the same sequence that I give them to you. So I'll say them and then I'll go like that. Just say them back. Y, T, R, H, don't write them. A, U, S, P, D, P, A, Y, H. Boy, somebody sounded like they got quite a few, but did any of you get all 13? By the way, the fact that you took notes is a good thing. It's one of the best things to help you remember. And I sit in front of classes where they just go, for 50 minutes I'm giving them wisdom and they're not taking a damn note. And then they wonder why they don't remember. You can't remember everything in a lecture. I'm going to rearrange the letters a little bit, see if you do any better. H A P P Y T H U R S D A Y. The letters in sequence. Whoosh, letters. Most of you got all 13. And you thought coming to this lecture you might gain nothing. I've just taken your short-term memory span, which is usually five to about nine letters, and expanded it to 13. Can you give them again? What are they? Damn, you're good. Or I'm good. 
Now, obviously, it was a little easier. Those were the same 13 letters. Same ones. If you're studying anything conceptual and you're trying to memorize it, it's like Y, T, R. It doesn't make any sense. It's in one eye, out the other. If it's out loud, one ear, out the other. But if you take the time to discover the meaning in it, suddenly it clicks. And I could probably ask you next week, what were the 13 letters? And most of you tell me. At the end of the quarter, I could ask you. Most of you could tell me. You might be confused. Was it Happy Wednesday or Thursday? But you'd guess probably Thursday. Now, some of you are in my intro class this quarter. And I do something that I wish I had time to do. I divide the class in two using a card so half reads one, the other half reads another card. I have one group try to estimate the number of vowels in a series of words that I read to them. So they're thinking about the words, but we'd say that's superficial thinking. How many vowels in mosquito? How many vowels in bottle? How many vowels in elephant? And they get to write down what they think is the number of vowels. The second group are instructed. They're told you need to think about how valuable this item would be if you were stranded on a deserted island. And you then rate its value on a five-point scale, one being no value, five being highly valuable. That's called deeper processing. You're now thinking about it in terms of its application or use. By the way, I always think elephant is a fun one. I'd give it a five, okay? Not only company, but if you got really hungry, you got a lot of food there, right? I then read, I think it's about 30 words. Everybody's writing down their numbers. I then have them do a stalling exercise where they write their name, phone number, and address. That's to dump short-term memory because they might be thinking about the words I just read. If you're now writing your name and address, it changes your focus. Short-term memory only lasts about 20 to 30 seconds. It's pretty brief. So I count it on the clock after 30 seconds. I say, now, write down as many words that you can recall. This one is so powerful. The group that's counting vowels, on average, remembers five out of about 30 words, time and time again. The group that's thinking about the usefulness on a deserted island remembers 10, okay? It's slightly more, 5.5 five, 5. 5 versus 10.5, but very close to a doubling without doing any more effort, simply by thinking about it instead of just trying to superficially think about it. And this is where, as a student, the more you get into the understanding, the better. Now, this then raises a fun question. What is the meaning of meaning? If I say something is meaningful or meaningless, what am I really saying? Now, I'm not going to go through a big drill, which is kind of fun of teasing it out of you. But a meaningful piece is a piece that relates to something you already know. And the best little analogy is it's like a file system that you've already got established, you add a new entry to it, so it's all neatly organized. And it's very easy if you've got a file system to add a new entry. We do it with computers also. The other way, meaningless, it's where something new doesn't fit with something already established. And so it's Greek to you. It's ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. What did you say? Okay. If it's something brand new and you can't relate it, you have to create a new entry. So you have to grapple with it. You have to say, what does that mean? But as I broke it down, I bet you could associate it with something you already understood. You've probably all seen little embryos. You got the idea of an egg, the idea that it kind of recaptures our development from a primitive one cell to a very complex mammal. You get that idea. That's the meaning of meaningfulness. Now, as a teacher, I think all of us or as we are teachers, we all try to make things meaningful in our classes. So we give stories, we give examples, but sometimes our examples don't work for you. This is where you have to tease it out. So I'm gonna to go to a couple things to help you there. First, study groups. 
we underutilize them, especially community college. Would people get through med school without study groups? <laughs> Not very many. Uh, do we have vet tech back there? Dental hygiene, vet tech. Pretty sophisticated stuff they have to learn, right? Do they do study groups? No? Oh my. I would hope they do. I would encourage them to do it. Where I've got students to form study groups, performance of the groups go up dramatically. Now part of it is probably because they're motivated to do that, so it's a bit confounded. But I'm convinced there's also the power of studying with other people. I know these concepts in psych so well, I can't see how they're confusing. But another student who's just found the answer can sometimes turn and say, Thursday, here's what it's about. And you go, ah, is that what Mr. Lobdell was saying? God, it's so easy. But I can't do that because I don't see where the problems lie in that particular concept. Study groups are great, okay? I'm not going to tell you how many of you totally hurt yourself in studying. How many of you magic mark, highlight, whatever you call it, your textbooks? The little yellow, pink, green, glow-in-the-dark sort of things. How many of you use the markers? Those were invented in 65, the year I started college. So I bought one. I turned entire books ugly orange. And then I figured it out. If you color every page solid orange, you've actually highlighted nothing. Yeah, by highlighting everything, you've really highlighted zip. So I did the clever thing, and you guys are way ahead of me. What do you highlight, folks? The most important thing. When do you do it? When you first read the book, right? Or the chapter. So you read through. Are you studying? No. I'm reading for the most important things. Zip, zip, zip. And some of you get out rulers to make it really neat. Take hours to make pretty little. Then you go back to the start of the chapter. You read the first thing you underlined and you go, oh, I remember that. No, you don't. You recognize it. People are incredible at confusing recognition with recollection. Your visual recognition threshold is so great, you can see a person once, see them years later and go, I know you. Were you a student at Pierce College? Yeah. Did you take psych? Yeah. From lobby? Yeah. yeah. 36 years I run into that, okay? Proof of this. Grab a magazine in your house that you haven't looked at for a while. Leaf through it. You will get the illusion of remembering virtually every advertisement and article. But to prove that it's not recollection, it's actually recognition, before you turn to the next page, predict what's on it. There's no way you're going to be right. But as soon as you turn, you go, oh, I remember that. No, you don't. You recognize it. Now, going back to your book. You've highlighted the most important stuff. You now go back to study it, and you say, oh, I remember it. So do you study it? No. no. So what don't you learn? Everything. The most important part of the chapter. And then they come in the next day all ready for the quiz. Oh, I studied hard last night, Mr. Lobdell. Here's your quiz. I don't believe it. I can't remember a thing. How many of you have heard that? Those of you who teach. I could retire now if I had a buck for every one of those comments. I don't correct him. I shake my head and think, poor baby, you think you knew it. But in fact, you recognized it. You didn't know it. Now back to this active learning. How do you know you know it? If you can look at it, go to the next one, read it, and then stop and go back to the one before. Look up in the sky and in your own words, say what that was about. Yeah, you know it. You will not forget it overnight unless you suffer a pretty major cerebral accident. It just doesn't happen. But while we're talking about this, most of you undo good studying by not sleeping adequately. Some of the latest work on REMing, we're not sure exactly how, but there's something going on. It involves the hippocampus. It involves the storage from a transitory long-term memory to a permanent, what we call consolidation. That just labels it, doesn't really say what's happening. But we're getting increasing evidence 
that that consolidation process is dependent on rapid eye movement sleep, which if you're an adult happens about every hour and a half once you fall asleep. If you're not getting a good night, typically around eight hours, you're not getting enough REM. What you've studied doesn't become permanent. And I can tell you there are studies that show simply by getting better rest, some students improve markedly in their performance because their brain now stores it a lot more efficiently. By the way, if you know anybody with sleep apnea, the biggest thing they'll tell you is, I can't remember anything. My brain shot. It's like my memory's gone. Yeah, it is, because your reming isn't happening, because you wake up so often, and you can't consolidate and store permanent memories. Here's the funny thing. There's no money to be made by telling people to get more sleep. So you don't hear about it on TV. Sylvian isn't telling you to get better sleep because they don't make any money. I tell students, and they go, yeah, that's nice. But they continue to use their time for other things. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? The best advice, sleep better, and most of you will do better. Most of you won't even begin to take it. And I know why. You've got so many other things to do. I'd ask you this. Are they important? Is studying and learning the most important thing you're doing as a student? If so, maybe you need to give up some of the other activities. I have students tell me, I don't have enough time. There's, two, what, 162 hours in a week? We all have the same amount of time. Marty has no more nor less than anybody in this room. The real question is, what do I do with my 162 hours? Am I going to use it well or use it not so well? Okay. I'm going to give you a couple other tips here. Taking notes, so vital. But most students who do it haven't learned a very simple rule. The first moment you get after a class, ideally right after the class, you should sit down with your notes and expand on everything you jotted down. Give it depth. Flesh it out. Okay? If you even wait to go home and do it a couple hours later, you will have forgotten some of your own notes. How many of you have done that? You've written beautiful notes, you get them home, you don't know what the hell you wrote. It's like, <laughs> what is this? Okay? Well, that's a wasted note. But if you take the moment right after class to flesh it out, you now have a little more detail. Odds are at night, you can still recollect it. That will be a powerful addition with only about a five-minute time investment per class. That is a good trade-off. Okay? Now, the next piece. Let's say you're trying to flesh out your notes. It's like, I remember they said it or he said it, but I don't know what it was about. Look for a classmate. They're usually hanging around. Go up to somebody and say, hey, what was that about? And they can tell you. Or flatter the heck out of us. Teachers want students to succeed. Sometimes it isn't perceived that way. We want you to do well. It makes us happy. And any time a student comes up in the lunchroom, where I always try to have my lunch and says, Marty, I didn't quite understand this. Can you give me another example? I love it. I'm important. It's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you come to my office, not just with I'm not getting anything, but what was that about when you were talking about REM sleep? You know? And I started explaining, that's what my life's about here. Okay, We love it. That's a legitimate thing. Or if you don't want to go to the instructor's office, most of us start up a class, any questions? Yeah, yesterday I didn't quite understand this piece about ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny. Okay, we'll go through that quickly. Once again, we like that. We want you to be successful. Okay, let me jump back here to see where I am in my presentation. Okay, I was talking about being active. Activity can also take the form of recitation. How many of you know the best way to learn is to teach somebody else? Boy, if you've got family members or roommates, teach them geography, psychology, anatomy. They often love it. One of my dearest students two years ago, I, God, I just loved her. I finally met her parents. She says, I've heard so much about you. I hear every lecture you've given. She would come home, sit around the dinner table, and recapitulate what I'd talked about. It's powerful because it reinforces your learning, plus it tells you if you really understood it. Because if mom or dad says, well, I don't quite get that, and you go, uh, I don't need understand it either, 
And then very quickly, you have to go back and redo it. Teaching another person. Now, some of you may not have anybody at home to teach, or they are not interested. Too bad. Teach an empty chair. There's nothing wrong with talking out loud. Thinking is internal talking to a large degree. There's also non-talking thinking. Talking out loud, as long as you know you're doing it, is not abnormal. If you think it's somebody else, or it's a real person in an empty chair, talk with me. I'll, I'll try to get you lined up with someone who can help. If you have roommates or friends, say, I'm just doing this little Socratic thing where I'm going to explain it to an empty chair. Dialogue with that empty chair. Practice it. Now, for some of you, writing it out in your own words is a good thing. I'm lazy. I never like to do a lot of writing. But I learned very quickly to look at it, look away, and do a little dialogue with myself. Because it told me if I really understood it or not very quickly. I would also do it with my kids, teach them as best I could, my spouse, anybody who would listen. It's a nice way of learning. Active recitation. By the way, one piece of research said 80% of your study time is best spent reciting and only 20% reading. Okay? This leads to, how are we doing? Ooh. I wanted to talk about textbooks. I brought the one I'm using in intro right now. Most students have not been taught how to use a textbook, and yet it's such a powerful tool. Because they haven't been taught the power of the tool, a large percentage don't even buy the book, in part because they're getting so darn expensive. Over 100 bucks for this little puppy here, I believe. These books are designed for what's called pedagogy. That's a fancy way of saying helping you learn. And they are seriously done to be, at least according to the people doing it, the most effective way of teaching. But students don't know the effective way of using it. How many of you know of SQ3R? None? One, two. I assumed all my students were still learning this until a few years ago I asked. It died out. There's also an SQ4R. There's a newer version of it, which uh, I'm not so familiar with. SQ3R, survey, that's the S. Question, that's the Q. Then you have three R's. Read, recite, review. And we were taught this because they knew pedagogically way back in those dark ages of the 60s that you retain much more from a text if you survey, question, read, recite, or recite, and review. So how do you do the survey? These are not novels. In a novel, you wouldn't want to read the last page, would you? Find out who done it, it would ruin the whole thing. But this is a textbook. So what you do is you actually go through the entire chapter. You look at pictures. Okay? What's this about apples? What's this about a duckbill platypus? Okay. And what you're doing is you survey, you ask questions. What are formal concepts? What's a superordinate concept? What are natural concepts? Prototypes. What is a prototype? So you raise questions as you go through. It only takes a couple of minutes to survey a chapter in any class. Okay? As you're surveying, you simultaneously raise questions. What you're doing then is causing you to be looking for answers. And this is a powerful thing. How many of you have noticed when you're looking through a newspaper for a piece of information, you can find it, it kind of jumps out at you? But if you're just kind of reading it haphazardly, kind of casually, most of what you read you don't even remember. There's something about it, and I can't explain it. I can only describe it. If you intend to find something, you find it. And I've got a little demonstration I could have brought where I actually show a placard with the words Boston and London printed on them. And I hold it up for 20 seconds. Out of a group this size, maybe two or three of you'd see Boston and London. Because before I do it, I tell you to look for letters, symbols, and numbers. I create what's called a set. You're now expecting not to see words, but letters. And even though Boston and London are printed on diagonal, most people don't see it. 
Likewise, if you just kind of go through a book without asking questions first, you kind of skiz over the content. You don't have the search mechanism going. Okay? The reading followed by the recitation, I talked about that. Technically, before a test, it should be review. It should be in the barn. Now you're just touching up to make sure you haven't lost anything or confused anything. But I know how this works. Because we schedule tests, most students don't start studying until shortly before an exam. And much like my friend, they put so much time all massed together and only study for about a half hour, pull all-nighters so they don't get the good rest, come in and do poorly. You're undoing yourself. If you start studying early and do some of the things I've talked about, by the time you get to the test, you're just reviewing at that point, not truly studying. Okay, use the book correctly, SQ3R. Okay, I got one last thing, and I'm going to I'm gonna get it. You've got to memorize facts. How do you do that? And I love it because I get a lot of students from anatomy coming to me going, I can't remember. What you use, mnemonics. In my view, they're quicker, easier than rote memorization. And I do use them. Mnemonics come in several flavors. We have uh, acronyms. We have the coined sayings. And interacting images. There are other types of mnemonics. Technically, taking notes is a mnemonic because a mnemonic is any system that facilitates recall. Most of what I've been talking about are technically mnemonics. But these are more formal, okay? How many of you have learned that you can take letters and form a word of it, uh, using those letters to remember certain facts? Okay. Uh, ones that come to my mind, Roy G. Biv. How many of you know about Roy G. Biv? <laughs> you know. Those are the colors of the rainbow. Now, if you're in an art class, that could be important. If you're taking physics and you're learning about the spectrum of light when it goes through a prism, or you're breaking down light in anything that refracts it out, like a rainbow, you know. Colors are what? Pretty easy. Now, how long would you have to work with flashcards to remember that. Now, in my intro to psych class, see if, anybody remember afferent, efferent? You can tell me. We both talk about this. Afferent neurons in the periphery, what do they do? From sensory receptors toward the CNS. Efferent? CNS? To the effectors, muscles basically, okay? The trouble is, when you're teaching this, and this is good for you to know as students, anytime two things are highly similar but not the same, you get maximal interference. That's how we talk about problems with remembering. So you memorize it without really knowing it, and you're sitting there on a quiz going, oh yeah, it's afferent. No, it's efferent. No, it's afferent. How many of you have done those flip-flops? And your brain gets, and then you tell the teacher, you're tricky. <laughs> it's not tricky if you know which is which. It's very easy. But if you're confused, it's terribly tricky. And I just once again think, oh, you didn't really know it. So when I tell my students, really, they're both the same. Whoop. Sensory are afferent. Motor, efferent. Now, with that little acronym, same, you can study very little. 
They're both the same. Now, this is where I had a student in my class say, okay, same, big deal, but I'm in anatomy and physiology. I says, what's giving you a hard time? He says, we're studying the heart. I said, well, I took a really light anatomy course. What are you studying? The left and right atria. One is deoxygenated blood, and the other one's oxygenated because one's on the way to the lungs, the other one's coming back from the lungs. And she said, I can't keep it straight. Now, that's a factoid. She understood the function of it. The concept was there. But every quiz, she'd flip-flop. The right is deoxygenated. No, the left is deoxygenated. Boo, boo, boo. So I said, okay, tell me which is which, because I don't know. She looked it up in her book, and I've never forgotten. She said, the right atrium is deoxygenated. Am I correct? Better be. I said, can you remember radio? This guy was sharp, says, that's not how you spell radio. I said, you're correct. It's an acronym. Right atrium deoxygenated. Her little eyes lighted up. With one little thing, she could keep it straight. Okay? And if the right atrium is deoxygenated, the left atrium is? Or Lado, if you like Lado. Okay? I don't know, it's dumb. Now, this is where I put a challenge to you. Sometimes acronyms can come up that are very easy. Now, I'm going to go with one, and you can help me on this. Twelve cranial nerves. Give me the saying. No, not, the, no, not that one. <laughs> There's two of them. Tongue top. And then viewed some hops. Okay? Now, what she just gave you were the 12 cranial nerves, the first letters, in descending, right, from the top to the bottom. And I've never learned all of them because I didn't take that serious. But if you know on old, obviously, O, O, you're going to have, what are they? Olfactory, optic. Okay, olfactory, optic, okay. And you go right down, old Olympus towering top, da, 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 okay. Now there's another one, O, O, to touch and feel. I don't go there. Okay? Only women instructors get away with that one. <laughs> no, 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 I won't go there. If you can come up with an acronym, or pardon me, a coined phrase, how about this? In 1492, there you go. How do you unscrew something? You turn it counterclockwise. You turn it clockwise. So I tried to teach my son this. He says, no, Dad, it's righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. That's another saying. It's perfectly good. It's just one that I didn't know. How many days in the calendar? 30 days, half September, April, June, and November. We used to learn that. They don't do it anymore. You kids have learned knuckle counting. January, February, March, April, May. It'll tell you long, short, but it will not tell you the number of days in February, nor the rule where leap year makes it 29, right? Little sayings can allow you to remember things very well. My very good mother just served us nine pizzas. She knows it. What are they? Planets from the sun outward. Unfortunately, the pizza is no more. <laughs> it got degraded, right? It's no longer a planet. Okay, those are the sayings. Sometimes a saying allows you to remember things. For my money, though, the third one, interacting images, is the best of all. And I'm going to draw from nutrition. How many of you have taken human nutrition? Aha! You can tell me then. How many calories per gram in protein? <laughs> Dang! Do you remember? Oh, no! It's four. By the way, some books say 4.5. Calories per gram in carbos? Four. Calories per gram in fat? And that's why when you consume fats, you're getting twice the package there. It's why Eskimos eat a lot of what? Fat. They need energy. 
That's why if we eat a lot of fat, we get the gut going. I had a woman come in, sweet lady, 40 years old, crying. I'm too old to learn. What? I said, I'm older than you. I can still learn. Come on, what is this? She was taking human nutrition. She understood the concept of protein, the concept of carbose, the concept of fat. She says, I can't remember the details. That's typical as we get older. I said, okay, you're stuck on a fact, not the concept. What are the facts? So she told me. I said, okay, let's start with something easy. Carbohydrates. You gotta remember four, and only four, to carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. You starting to see? Interacting image. How many syllables in the world? Just say it, carbohydrate, four. Now, I said there's an easier one. When I hear the word carbohydrate, that first part, C-A-R, is what? What's C-A-R? Car. How many wheels on a car? Four. Cars have four wheels. Carbohydrate would have four. Now, how many of you know about racing? You got the pro car circuit. Would a pro car have four? Just like a car. Protein, pro car, four. Now she's starting to see what I'm getting at. Fat, fat. How do you remember nine in fat? And she goes, that's my problem. I can't remember. Well, let me ask you. Some of you know about cats, vet tech, right? How many lives do they have? Nine lives. Now, there's also an expression for rich people. What do we call a rich person regarding cats? Would a fat cat definitely have nine lives? So I picture fat cats with nine lives. This woman was almost glee, gleefully happy. Nine calories per gram in a fat cat. Now, I've used this in classes, and I try to get people to realize interacting Im images work even better if they're a little weird. The weirder, the better, actually. But if you share them with friends, they may go, ooh, my God, you're sick. So you may not want to share them all. I have a bunch, and I will not share them in this class. They keep <laughs> things straight in my mind, but they would sound weird. But one gal came down, and it was so cute. She says, Marty, I have a way to remember nine. She goes, I was stationed in Germany. I picture a very obese Fraulein looking at a bowl of strudel, going, nine, nine. <laughs> I loved it, because it's a homophone. Yeah. But do you think she'll ever forget nine and fat? Mm -hmm. She'll just picture the two together. Now, the more you can create those interacting images, the easier it is to remember facts. By the way, alcohol, anybody know? Seven calories per gram. How many letters are in the word alcohol? Seven. And if you're a bartender, what's the classic call drink? Seagram seven with seven up. They call them seven sevens. Sevens everywhere. So the more you know about Seagram seven with seven, it's like seven calories per gram. By the way, that's also why if you drink a lot, you get heavy quick. It's not very utilizable, but it is energy in your body, which we convert to fat fairly quickly. Okay, got the idea? By the way, eggnog, whoo, fat and alcohol, yeah, you can pork out almost instantly. I've gone beyond my time. I know that she has to be out of here. I think there might be another class. I thank you so much. There's a handout up there. There's also, God. I, I'm not going to do this. Uh, I've been here long enough, I don't have to. If you have questions, come see me. You were a great group, thank you.